that's one of my favorite hymns to sing as a choir. And uh, if that doesn't break the cobwebs loose, nothing will <laughs> this morning. So glad to have you here this morning, and we rejoice in having another year to celebrate the birth of our Savior. And uh, also get to spend it together with people we love, and that's always always a nice thing. Patty and I left uh, early on uh, Thursday morning, wasn't it? And uh, knowing, of course, that it was probably going to be pretty bad out, not knowing how bad it was going to be. But I don't think we more than got outside of town before a four-wheel drive went into gear, and uh, we drove uh, probably most of the way to about Menominee, um, Menominee, Wisconsin, about two-thirds of the way. Five hour drive, two or thirds of it, at about 40 miles an hour. So, but we were determined to get there and see our ch our children and grandchildren, and and who knows when you get to be our age, it might be the last time you get to do it. So, good morning, good to see you, Lily and Serena. Good to have you here. Better late than never, sister. Well, we're going to uh, be looking, of course, again to Revelation chapter 4. And we're looking at the throne of God. The throne of God. What we're looking at is the sovereignty of God. And that is something I think that very few people really comprehend today. It's been one of those things that gets so corrupted. Uh, one of those doctrines that gets so corrupted. But it's an important one. What we fail to see often in, in the Bible is that what we have in this world is really just a shadow or a type of what we see in glory. And so over the years, of course, mankind has developed kings and sovereignties and those kind of things over nations and, and uh, even world empires. And, and we saw to some degree uh, in those types how men trying to take on the role of God. And of course that is, uh, God has ordained governments, but God has never ordained that uh, men take on the role of God. There are some things that we are commanded to do. We are to, uh, we are to judge evil. And uh, of course we have governments to do that as well. But the throne of God is an important revelation to us and what we're seeing here as we've talked about in the last few weeks is that God is using the Apostle John to give us a vision into heaven we can't see it John saw it so when I read Revelation chapter 4 and portions in Ezekiel and, and Isaiah where these men were given a vision into heaven into the spiritual dimension uh, I see them now through the eyes of faith that they saw. I see the things that they saw, but they probably comprehended more with their eyes than what I can comprehend with my faith. Otherwise, they saw the same things, and now they're trying to describe those things to us in ways that we can understand, trying to, comp trying to describe the incomprehensible in a comprehensible way. <laughs> trying to, kind of, to, to describe the infinite in a finite way. It's a pretty difficult task. Uh, and so if I mess up on it, please understand, okay? Uh, I, I don't anywhere near have the, uh, what John saw here, or, uh, and I don't think my imagination could go that far, nor do I believe God wants me to start rambling on about all kinds of imaginations and speculations. I think we probably should try to stay within the confines of what God says. And, uh, but we have a difficulty. Most people live in a small bubble no longer than their own, uh, no larger than their own empir empirical uh, evidences. I remember being at a Bible conference one time and, and uh, this man had brought uh, 12 boys that he had taken from the Kentucky Hills. And he brought them to the Bible conference. The first time in their whole life now they'd ever been out of the Kentucky Hills. His experience with them was the first time they'd ever had anybody buy shoes just for them. 
Now they had worn shoes from other people and they had you know, done all kinds of things to repair them and make them work, but now these are poor kids and they've been taken out of these Kentucky Hills and uh, moonshine and daddies and all that kind of stuff and, and, they're, and they're brought into an environment where they're loved, but now they travel a thousand miles to Indianapolis to a Bible conference. And I asked that little boy, I said, I asked one of those little boys, I said, what's this like to you? He says, I've never seen anything like this in my life. <laughs> he said, the lights, are the, the, all of the lights and all, everything that's in the city. He said, when we first drove here, he said, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was about uh, seven years old. We drove from our little town of Dodge Center, Minnesota, 1,300 people. And we drove to Rochester, Minnesota, and there was a place there called Miracle Mile Shopping Center. And it was about 12 blocks long, as bigger than our whole downtown. And it was all kinds, this was around Christmas, lights everywhere. My eyes got so big, I was so amazed at what I was saying, I couldn't believe it. And I said, do people live here? Of course, nobody lived there, they just shopped there. But it was amazing. And that's what we have here. We have this little bubble that we live in. Now, my wife and I, we've traveled all over the United States of America. There's only, uh, only been, there's only four states in, this, in, this, in, the, in the country we haven't been in. But we've, we've been all over the country. We've, we've seen the beauties and the grandeurs of, of practically everything that is here. And it's wonderful. But I guarantee you, there's nothing compared to what's ahead of us. And that's what John sees. But we live in this little bubble, and faith takes us outside of it. So they, they know nothing. These people that live in this little bubble know nothing beyond what they have seen, touched, smelled, felt, or experienced in some other way. And if God exists in their thinking, if he exists, he must fit inside their comprehensible little bubble. Well, God must be comprehensible. Remember, God is, com in, God is incomprehensible, but he is knowable. There's a difference between those things. God must be part of their experience rather than they are being part of his. And that is a big dividing factor. I understand that, yes, God is involved in my experience, but mainly... I am a part of his. I'm a part of his existence. So however, the point of Revelation chapter 4 is that the sovereign creator of God of the universe is incomprehensible and so infinite, it is not even possible to wrap your tiny genius around his lordship. I don't care how brilliant you are. You are not going to be able to wrap your mind around who God is. These, these discussions I have all the time. One, one young man said, well, God must be enormous. I mean, he's got to be bigger than the universe, right? Think of how big the universe, if God's going to control that, he's got to be bigger than that. I said, what if God is smaller than an atom? Does that in any way lessen his power to be able to control an infinite universe? <laughs> the size of God doesn't matter. It's who God is. We can't even wrap our minds around who God is. <laughs> so that's the point of Revelation chapter 4. Anytime the word of God mentions the throne of God, the subject is God's sovereign, judicial authority over his creation and the creatures of his creation. And this is known as the lordship of God. When we talk about lordship, this is a word we banter around today. Again, without much comprehension of what it means. We call Jesus Lord. We confess that he is Lord. We use those terms without really comprehending that it connects us to a being who spoke the world into existence, who is eternal, self-existent. He doesn't need us, but he loves us. So to call Jesus Lord, without understanding his sovereign judicial authority over his creation and the creatures of his creation, 
is really an empty use of the word. And quite frankly, it may approach taking God's name in vain if we don't comprehend what it is. The Jews would not read the word Jehovah when they came through in the scripture lest they feared taking that name in vain, using it outside of its understanding and scope. They reverenced it. We need to be more comprehensive in regarding to who uh, the being is we talk when we call him Lord and then in our relationship to him. This is a substance of Revelation chapter 4. So understanding the term Lord and its relationship to who and what Jesus is brings a creature in awe before his creator. God, the eternal self-existent one, becoming a man. <laughs> can't, can't comprehend that, but I know it's true. Why God would do that? I don't understand why, but I know he did. So faith introduces the sinner that understands the term Lord into a, an infinite bubble of existence. It's really incomprehensible because it is infinite. And every being around the throne of God is there in awe of the being we know as God and of which we confess as Lord. That's the substance of Revelation chapter 4. Every being around there is in awe of God. Worship, praise, adoration will be automatic because those around the throne will understand and know the God on the throne. Have you thought about that today? The God we worship? The one who has said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Have you thought about today that you walk, live, in the presence and knowledge of that God that there's nothing about you he does not know. There's not any aspect of your life in which he is not involved. Yeah, that's a wow truth. When you know that, that those people will be overwhelmed by his presence and in awe of who and what he is. That's what we see in Revelation chapter 4. We think in these terms in the context of this world. And God's intent is for us to think of these terms in out of this world context. Otherwise, we bring the terms into our world and we think about them in this context. God wants us to take these words out of our context and put them in the context of heaven. An eternal. The being of a creator. So in Revelation 4, 2 through 5, we are given one of the most spectacular visions of heaven anywhere in the Bible. We're not told a great deal about heaven. And I believe the reason why is because we couldn't wait to get there. Communicating this faith vision to others, including the scoffers that we talked about in the last few weeks, is one of the responsibilities to believers that addressed in 2 Peter chapter 3 and, and 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 4 that we, that we talked about last, uh, last week and the week before. And to fully appreciate it, we must let our imaginations escape the temporal confinements of our own time and space. Now, I'm not talking about having some kind of mystical experience. But we must move our minds outside the boundaries of earth into this spiritual realm of heavenly things. And here is a realm of holiness and righteousness here is a timeless dwelling place of millions, perhaps billions of billions of angels. Here's where God lives. Here's where God exists and, and where he is a sovereign of the universe. This throne is from where God reigns, rules, judges, moves, and transfigures you and I. Now, with that in mind, let's stand together out of respect for God's word. If you're able, if you're not able to, you're welcome to be seated. Revelations 4, verses 2 through 5. And John says, immediately I was in the spirit, otherwise in the spiritual realm of existence, what was hitherto darkness 
No, he's brought into the light of God's existence in the this eternal dimension of which we can't see right now. A spiritual dimension where spiritual beings live. And he says, and behold, a throne. I want you to, as we read this, notice and underline sometime how many times the word throne is used in this text. Behold, a throne. And of course, the idea of the word behold is set your Set your eyes upon this. Keep your faith eyes fixed upon this throne. Because it was set in heaven. And then it says, And one sat on that throne. On the throne. There wasn't more than one. Just one sat on that throne. We saw from Revelation 1 that this one is Jesus. And it says, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sar sar sardine stone, otherwise like a shining jewel. Now he's trying to give some kind of, like a, a, like when the light catches a jasper stone or a sardine stone and, and it shines through that in its brilliance. That's what it was like. And it says, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. A rainbow in our dimensions are, are oval or or half moon. This was a spherical moon. Well, we're thinking three dimension. The throne, we, we, we think of it, well, it's got to be set in some place. No, <laughs> it can be suspended in God's world. And this emerald rainbow is spherical. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now we'll see tonight that these are the 12 uh, heads of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. And there were seven lamps of fire before, burning before the throne, and which are the seven spirits of God, or the seven manifestations of the Spirit, I, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4, but we're, verse 1 through 4 is a text there. Seven manifestations of the Spirit. And, of course, the emphasis, as we'll see, is judgment. What's going to happen in the tribulation time? Judgment. Thunders and lightnings, these are words of judgment. Fear should come with these ideas and the vision of God. So, Father, as we bow before you tonight, and, or this morning, and we ask, Lord, for your uh, unction of your spirit, that, Lord, you would teach us and press upon us the great truths that are here. Help us to see you in, with the eyes of faith the way you want us to see you. And Lord, to stand here this morning in awe and adoration and praise that we can call you God the Father. <laughs> wow. We pray for anyone who's listening this morning here or online that if they're not saved, born again, and they're still part of this cursed world, that, Lord, today they come to understand that they must be born again. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The throne of God. I don't know. I've often thought about if I were to look in throughout the scriptures and, and to look at this subject and just do a series of messages on it, how long it would take to exhaust what the scriptures say. And I, I began to just look at a few places and I decided I don't think I could live long enough to do that. The Bible is that exhaustive about the sovereignty of God. The throne upon which God sets is obviously beyond this earth. It's not part of this world. It is beyond this universe. When I'm talking about this universe, I'm, I'm talking it's outside of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and probably outside of all of that. But we have no idea. It may, may just be right next to you in another dimension that we can't see. So distance may not be the problem. And when we think about the glory of God filling, uh, filling the universe, whatever, wherever, whatever God has created, he fills. Except for rebellious people. He only fills them when they surrender to his filling. Somewhere beyond all that 
we might imagine is a place called heaven. When I say a place, it is, it is a place. Eternity is God's eternal existence. So when God gives you eternal life, he's giving you and sharing with you his eternal life, his eternal existence. And one day, he's going to create a new place called a new heaven and a new earth just for his redeemed to dwell with him. And the present throne of God that sets in the heavenly Jerusalem is going to descend from heaven into this new place called the new heaven and earth. And it's going to be in the middle of it. And there, there will be a, a wonderful, wonderful thing because he will be the light thereof. There will be no need of any other. That's what John sees. So at the center of this eternal existence is a spiritual place where God and where his throne is. And this throne is beyond the wildest extremes of science fiction and human imagination because it's not fiction. It's real. <laughs> Spherically around this throne, suspended in space, is something that appears like a, an emerald colored rainbow, Revelation 4.3. We're not told how far this emerald sphere extends from the throne at its center, but it probably extends into infinity. But remember, the reason why there is a glow is because it is the glory of God which becomes visible. And the glory of God is the attributes of God. Otherwise, it is who God is that shines. So what is this emerald sphere? Well, according to Ezekiel 128, it's the radiant glory of God. The question I have before you this morning is, can we even imagine a being such as this? Can, can we even imagine him? Can our minds, can, can we comprehend a being whose very existence outshines the stars of the whole universe? Can we imagine a being whose holiness is truth, in truth is, is visibly seen through the means of his radiant glory? In this realm of existence, there is no darkness that his glory does not fill with light. There, there are no shadows or shades of gray. If this spiritual dimension became uh, evident right now, space would immediately be lighted. There would be no darkness in outer space. It would be immediately lighted where the light so bright would outshine the sun. There are no sh shadows or shades of gray in the realm of God's existence. There's no place in the universe that his visible essence does not fill. He fills the space he created but yet exists outside of it and beyond that space. Try to comprehend that God. Heaven is simply the place of God's existence. Heaven is eternal because God eternally exists. And when you go to heaven, you go into God's eternal existence and become part of him and you share his life. You never become a God, as the Mormons teach, but you do share his existence. Now, without him, heaven would be just another place. You know, I can have dinner at home with my wonderful wife. I can go to a restaurant here in town. But all of those are just another place. Why would I want to go to heaven? Because God's there. You see, this, this is where believers will live one day, what we see in Revelation chapter 4. This is where we're going to live. Not just in a place called heaven, but in the presence of God called heaven. Oh, oh, that will be glory. You want to sing, oh, that will be glory. That will be. The emerald rainbow round about the throne and the lightnings and the thundering voices coming from the throne provide two different emphases. The emerald spherical rainbow emphasizes that God is light. 
And it both uh, and it's both omniscient and omnipresent. Omniscient means he's all knowing. Omnipresent means he's everywhere present. For the light of his glory extends into all his creation, touching that creation with both his power and his presence. That's God. Einstein had uh, postulated a power in the universe that was unseeable. And it was called, uh, they, he called it the cosmological constant. And all the scientists of the world called it Einstein's folly and mocked him and ridiculed him for it. But he says there's an imp invisible power in the universe that holds everything into place, otherwise it would just be chaos. And he says you can't see the power, it's invisible. He says we don't know what it is. And, and I said, I, want, I wanted to raise my hand and said, I know, I know, I know. That's what we see here in this throne. The point is there's th that there is nothing or nowhere that, that his being does not know experientially and touch in an extremely personal way. There's no place you can hide from God. <laughs> there's nothing about you he does not know. Every little microbe, uh, my, 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 microbe in your body he knows. Every little piece of energy going on through your brain. Every little... A piece of energy that stores some little bit of knowledge. God is there and knows it. And is part of the mechanism of it all working the way it's supposed to work. Secondly, there's nothing beyond his power to either bless or judge. Now get that. There's nothing beyond his power to either bless or judge. That's the sovereignty of God. That is the emphasis of the terms lightnings and thunderings and voices. We remember on Sinai, when the children of Israel, God had said, I want you all to be priests. I want the whole nation to be a, a nation of priests. And uh, Moses is up there uh, with the thunderings and lightnings and voices, and, and they are all standing down on the mountain, and they say, oh, nope, we don't want that. think that we probably are rethinking this thing. We, we had consented to it originally, but we didn't really know what we were doing, and, and, uh, and we want to get out of this contract. And so God chose the tribe of Levi to be his priest instead of the firstborn of all Israel. So there was some fear involved, <laughs> obviously. And that because they know that God is God is a a being that ought to be feared. In fact, he says himself, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but a fool despises wisdom and instruction. Here's where it all starts. If you know God, fear him, because he's a holy God. And although God has spoken in audible languages, he speaks more often in judgments and blessings, because these seem to be the only voices some will hear. Some people won't hear the voice of God. And so God has to speak to them in chastisement or, or judgments. Some are natural, some are supernatural. What I mean by natural, you sow something, you reap something. You sow corruption, you reap corruption. That's a natural thing. Right? I, I, uh, you know, it, it is the way of the transgressor is hard. I had a young man come into my office one time, and he's been living in rebellion all his life. And, and uh, I said, do you understand why things are so difficult for you? Why you just can't ever seem to get going and make things work? And he said, no. And I said, well, the way of the transgressor is hard. Now, that doesn't mean life isn't hard in itself, but the way of the tra transgressor is particularly hard. And probably in my 45-minute conversation, I said to him, the way of the transgressor is hard a dozen times. And at the end of that conversation, I said, well, what did you learn today? He said, I learned the way of the transgressor is hard. I said, no, you haven't. You haven't learned it until you repent and change your life. 
And you're going to keep learning that lesson. Because the way of transgressor gets harder and harder. Now, <laughs> let's look at the 24 elders surrounding the throne of God. Why does God create? Why does someone who is so awesome create? I don't, I don't know. I don't know why he created angels. He created angels for us, not for himself. He created angels so they could serve mankind. But they didn't, a good portion of them, the Bible says a third of them didn't want to serve mankind. Because they're just a bunch of feeble little bugs and they didn't want to be uh, the servants of mankind. They wanted to be worshipped. And so they rebelled against God. But God has these beings there who really know who he is. They worship him. And Church, or what we know as church, a formal gathering together of beings, is an everyday constant occurrence of heaven. In fact, I don't believe we'll ever get exhaust our awe and worship of God when we're in heaven. And we certainly ought not to exhaust it here. It's certainly not something we do one or two hours a week. It ought to be something that occupies our time. And so there are 24 elders surrounding the throne of God, it says in Revelation 4.4. 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. That's important. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. That's important. Remember, uh, heaven is a kingdom of priests. Kings and priests in heaven just as the kingdom age will be a rule by kings and priests. You and I are faithful of this age, if we are faithful, I want to presume upon that, if we are faithful, we will be the kings of which Jesus is the king. We will be the lords, small l, of which Jesus will be the Lord, capital L. We will rule and reign with Jesus with a rod of iron during the kingdom age. But here, we see all of these beings sitting around this wonderful throne of God in awe and worship. Now, there are a lot of suppositions about the identity of these 24 elders. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them uh, showing what they aren't. I'm going to spend more time showing what they are. But uh, some say these 24 elders are representatives of the church. Since they are individuals, they would have identities. And if they have identities, there must be something about them that would cause God to single them out above the rest. And to support this interpretation, 1 Chronicles 24, 7 through 19 is used, and 1 Chronicles 25, 9 through 30. Uh, Newell's commentary uh, on the book of Revelation, uh, his idea is that this, his argument or interpretation is for angels, these are angelic beings, these 24 seats. But let me say very emphatically, these interpretations are wrong. So how can you be so sure? Well. Um, I can be sure that so you can look up all those portions of scripture you want. But the wrong interpretation is driven by those holding an Episcopal view of church government and falsely leads local churches into an Episcopacy. That is where you have a Nicolaitan system with clergy ruling over the church, a hierarchy of clergy ruling over the church, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it is in the Catholicism, it's popes and cardinals and bishops and, and deacons and the whole hierarchy of rule and uh, reformed churches, it's similar. There's a orders, it's called the orders of the Episcopacy. But Episcopal government is not found in the Word of God. So considering what Christ says in Revelation 2.6 and Revelation 2.15, that he hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, I, I think this uh, this is, I hardly think that this is a possible intent here. Another false supposition is that these 24 elders are 24 patriarchs of the Old Testament who are in the messianic line. And 11 of these 24 patriarchs of the Old Testament are supposedly listed in, in other portions of scripture, nine in Genesis 11, Isaac in Genesis 21, Jacob in Genesis 25, Judah in Genesis 29, and Pharaoh's in Genesis 38, 29. But the difficulty of this 
Paul's position is why single out only 24 patriarchs in the Messianic line? Matthew lists 40 in the genealogy of Joseph, and Luke lists 75 in the genealogy of Mary. And even in these seemingly thorough genealogies, the probability are there there are seven, several generations missing. So this isn't it. So another false supposition that these elders are angels who are leaders of heavenly worship. I think this could be a logical argument. That's where Newell gets his. But if it were not for the fact of description of what they're wearing in Revelation 4.4, 4, we, we wouldn't be able to understand it. Otherwise, these confusions would be confusing. But this is clarity. And he says, in round about the throne, there were 20, or four and 20 seats, 24. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20, 24 elders seated, seated, sitting, clothed in white raiment. That's important. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. So both white raiment and crowns of gold speak of the clothing of the redeemed. Angels are not numbered with the redeemed or promised uh, any form of rule. In fact, they don't even understand the doctrine of redemption. They wonder at it. Otherwise, one of the things they wonder is, why would God do that for these worms? They wonder at it. They can't comprehend it. Uh, who then are these 24 elders, and how can we know with surety? Well, these 24 elders are the 12 patriarchs of Israel and the 12 apostles. Go with me to Exodus chapter 19. They are 12 identifiable individuals who represent the whole of uh, the holy and royal priesthood of God from both Israel and the church. Otherwise, they represent the whole. They're not the whole. They're just representatives of the whole. And so uh, we have one high priest, one intercessor between, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So we don't pray to these individuals, but they represent uh, us there uh, before the Lord. So Exodus 19, 6 says, And ye shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou spake unto the children of Israel. Look at 1 Peter 2, 5-9. It will be up there on the screen for you. He talks there about you are lively stones, or you have been taken, you are a dead stone. Now God has breathed into you the breath of life, and you have become a living stone. And I built up a spiritual house. You put all the living stones together. You have a living spiritual house. That's a church. And in a holy priesthood, every priesthood of every believer, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. He is our, our intercessor, our advocate before the Father in the, holy, uh, in the Holy of Holies in heaven. Wherefore also this contained inscription, Behold, I lay in Zion. Now Zion is always Jerusalem. But there is a Zion which is earthly, that's the earthly Jerusalem. There is a Zion which is heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. One day the heavenly Jerusalem, this creation and this Jerusalem will be dissolved with fervent heat. The heavenly Jerusalem will be moved to uh, the new heaven and the new earth. And at the kingdom age, the beginning of it, the king who sits upon the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4 will come and establish his throne, that's Zionism, on the throne in Israel from the world. So I lay in Zion a chief, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, that's a hierarchy of Israel, the same as made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And has made us, in Revelation 1 6, has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The fact that these 24 are there in their royal uh, garments of priestly garments of, of white linen and crowns on their head give us hope. For in them that is 
where we will be one day. So this understanding of the, who these 24 elders are supported by Revelation 21, 12 through 13 and is the cherry on the top of the sunny. And it says that had a great wall and, and high and had 12 gates. This is the new heaven and new earth. And the 12 gates are the 12 gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. This is the new heaven and the new earth now. And on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, um, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations in the names, uh, in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So what we see in these 24 seats now are now brought into the new creation. And they are there as historical eternal reminders of redemption. Redemption. God's long suffering with us through all the millennia of time. I don't believe we'll ever uh, have a day in heaven and glory when we will not ask the question, God, why would you do this for us? Who are we that would, you would even want to do this for us? It's beyond comprehension. No one can truly understand it except someone who has raised children. You pour your heart and soul and life into them, wanting the best, doing all you can to raise them up with, to be what they should be without spoiling them rotten. But we all know we all have that tendency, right? And this is God who loves us so much so much. Do you know him? Oh, I'm not talking about do you know about him. Almost everybody knows about him. I'm talking about do you know him personally? Do you have a conversation with him? Have you been born again? Have you repented of sin and dead works? Have you believed and understood the gospel? God's wrath has been satisfied through the body and offering of Jesus Christ once for all. And that he wants to gift you his righteousness in the person of his indwelling Holy Spirit. That's justification. If you will simply but confess him to be the Lord God, Jehovah incarnate in human flesh. And that you will call upon the name of the Lord to save you. He promises to as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name oh it's so simple so simple be born again Father God as we bow before you this morning we are so rejoicing in the revelation of who you are that we can know you not just intellectually but know you personally oh Father we want to know you the way you know us and we know one day we will. We rejoice today in the opportunity to be given invitation to people who do not know you, that they might. And we pray for them today. We pray that your spirit, wherever they are, from wherever they're watching uh, right now and hearing or listening, that, Lord, your spirit would prick their heart and that they would understand how lost they are and come to receive the gift that you give them in Jesus Christ in whose name we pray amen